Hi there and welcome to our final episode of Series 1 of Release the Sound, a podcast on prophetic worship. We are filming this at the same time for YouTube. So if you want to go and watch this on YouTube or play it for your worship teams, feel free to do so. And in this last session, firstly, I want to say thank you so much for being so engaged. And secondly, I want to answer the most common questions that we have received as we've done this series. And number three, I want to let you know a series two is going to be coming out and it will all be around interviewing some amazing prophetic worshippers around the world and hearing their process as well. But today for this podcast, I wanted to answer some of the common questions. We sent a, um, a request out to all our social media accounts and we got so many questions. So I'm going to try and answer as many as I can. I'll be looking at my notes here if you're watching on YouTube because I wanted to make sure that my thoughts were really well laid out. And I'm going to start with the very first question. Let's see how many we get through. Here we go. The first question we received was, what is the difference between spontaneous worship and prophetic worship such a great question and so many people ask this question and these are some of my personal th thoughts personally i think that the spontaneous song is prophetic worship but not all prophetic worship is spontaneous so it can be spontaneous you can just be off the cuff you can you can sing whatever's on your heart or play whatever's on your heart in the moment but it also can be structured and um, it can also be soaking music, you know, where people just feel to sit and to meditate and reflect and experience God's peace in a worship service. So it's it's not spontaneous worship is definitely prophetic, but prophetic worship doesn't have to be spontaneous. And I'll explain that in a little bit more depth as we go along. But I wanted to actually put a side note in here that spontaneous and prophetic worship, full stop, it's not all music either. It can transcend many art forms. We naturally, when we say the word worship in our modern day Western culture, we think music in, in terms of church life, but worship means so much more. I, I, I don't think I really have to say that. I think you already get that. But worship not only means the way we live our life, but it can also transcend many different art forms. And if you are in a church where it does that, that's just wonderful and beautiful. I love when I see it transcending many art forms and the prophetic transcending a lot of art forms as well. So most people, when they think of prophetic worship, they immediately think that it does begin with the spontaneous and that would that's totally fair. That's what we think of when we think of the prophetic. And it's certainly one way to release prophetic worship, but it's actually only one facet of the prophetic in worship. And yes, I'm repeating myself, prophetic worship can transcend the spontaneous as well. But here's some things that I perceive, because now that we've explained that, what really is prophetic worship? Now, we talk about that in the first two episodes of this podcast in more of a theological way. But let me give you some really quick tips. So prophetic worship could be this. It could be choosing songs in your set lists thoughtfully or choosing songs as you are led by the spirit to choose them rather than choosing them based on current trends. This is what every church is singing. This is in the top 10. If that's the only reason we're choosing songs, then I would say we're not being prophetically led. So choosing songs and your set list that are thoughtfully chosen, spirit led, you're asking the Holy Spirit, what song should we be doing in such and such service? It could be an older song. It could be a hymn that you feel led to sing. I've got this beautiful story uh, of my friend, Pastor Stacey Hillier, who's an epic pastor and worship leader at our church in Melbourne. We're going to interview her in season two. But uh, when we were in the hardest and the harshest part of our lockdowns and we were recording our services to broadcast to our church, she was telling this story of how she'd organised the whole set list and they were recording the service and halfway through she felt like like the Lord just say, I want you to change the set list and I want you to sing Great Southland, uh, which is, a you know, if you're not in Australia, you won't know that song, but it's kind of, it's an epic worship song about our nation. And as she started to sing that song, this is the great Southland of the Holy Spirit, there was an earthquake. Now, that would be my, my example, an incredible example of 
changing, being prophetically led because she felt that something was happening in the land. She felt like there was a rumbling going on. She felt like there needed to be a prophetic declaration over our nation because of everything that was going on. And the earth was responding at the same time. Now, whether that earthquake happens because the song happens or vice versa, we're never going to know, right? can just simply just be because that's what's going on with um, our, our, sca our scape in the land. But there was this, uh, there was this uh, sensation, there was this tangible feeling that we had to change what we were doing. And so I just think that's a beautiful example of choosing an older song or a hymn that you feel led to sing in the moment. That's prophetic worship as well. It can also be a song that's written that's based on something that the Lord's highlighting to you. So you could either choose a song or write a song on something that's highlighted in your spirit. Spirit. Now, what does that mean? Well, you might feel like you're all of a sudden inspired to write about a particular topic or choose a particular song in the moment. You might even feel an urgency to write it or an urgency to sing it. And that would be a great example of prophetically led worship. Essentially, prophetic worship is simply this. It's being led by the Holy Spirit. He's the navigator. He's holding the map, not you or me. He's the one going, this is where we're going and we're just following. That's when we're inspired by his ideas and not our own. Now, that might be a really simple idea, but I want to tell you, I hear so many worship pastors and worship teams simply choosing songs because everybody's doing it or because it sounded good to them at the time. But being a lot more thoughtful about what matches what's happening in our own personal local church life is beautiful. It's actually far more powerful because you're choosing songs that already the voice, the heart voice is singing amongst the people or need to sing. And so prophetic led worship is important in this aspect of choosing songs, not just singing spontaneously, but being prophetically led. So spontaneous is prophetic worship but also prophetic worship's not always spontaneous. Let's go to the next question. And that was this, is prophetic worship singing a promise or is it worshiping and God drops a word or a vision into your mind? What a great question. Is prophetic worship singing a promise or is it worshiping and God drops a word or a vision into your minds? Here's some of my thoughts around that. I think it can be both. And that's really determined by how you receive and how you release. What do I mean by that? Well, learning how you receive will help you actually hear and release the prophetic song in greater measure. So you actually need to start first here. Answer this question, how do I best receive? So you might have heard uh, the whole teaching around there being different types of learners, for example. So you can apply, apply that same idea to different types of ways you receive from God. For example, we have auditory learners, auditory learners who learn best by hearing instructions or hearing training. We might have visual learners who like to see how to do something. Uh, there's kinesthetic learners who learn by doing it, by touching, feeling, sensory. Um, they like getting their hands dirty. Then you've, dirty. Then you've got reading and writing learners, those who prefer written instructions or to write things down to learn. Well, the same idea can be applied for how we receive from God because different people receive differently from the Lord. They'll get their downloads in different ways. So for example, not everyone's a seer. Not everybody sees a picture. Um, some people hear Others might get a scripture in their mind. That's that reading and writing example. Or it might be a sensation in their body, kinesthetic, or they grow in their gift by practicing. That's another example of the kinesthetic learner, kinesthetic receiver. So for others, they might see something in their mind. They are actually seers. Um, that's me. I'm a, I would say I'm a cross between a kinesthetic and a seer. I have to do it. I have to be in the middle of it to experience it, which is why it's important to take risks if you're that type of person. It's always important to take risks. But, you know, for me, it's 
it's essential. And then I see, I'll see a picture and I'll sing it out, but not everybody receives that way. And so learning how you receive will help you understand how the Lord wants you to release something. And then finding that primary receptor from hearing from God is an amazing starting point in helping you to release the prophetic song. So isn't this a beautiful idea? You're not only learning to release something, you're learning things about yourself as well. And as we become um, more accepting and not competing or comparing with other people and how you see other people receive in the prophetic makes a huge difference. You start be to become comfortable in your own skills and then you start to hone them. You start to be able to sing things out more confidently or play things out more confidently. So a great question, a great starting point is really just what am I seeing, sensing, hearing? How do you receive? And then ask yourself that question as you are practicing the prophetic. Now, if you don't know what practicing the prophetic means, go back to the first and session second episodes of this so that you uh, of this series so that you get a bit of an understanding of what I'm talking about here. But what are you seeing? What are you sensing? What are you hearing? Asking those questions, um, being self-aware as you are being God aware is really, really powerful. And finally, to end in answering that question, singing a promise definitely can be considered prophetic, but what makes it prophetic is when you step out and you sing what God is breathing on in the moment. It's the now word. So you can start with a promise as an entry into the prophetic, but then there needs to be the process of searching for the hidden, the deep thing that God is wanting to say. And that, as mentioned, is what we've just talked about here. It's processed differently by everyone. Let's move to the next question. What do I do to get ready? How do I know how to flow? Love this question. And this is my answer. It can't be just a Sunday thing or a service thing. It has to be a lifestyle. So first things first, I've got daily habits that I use as part of growing in my anointing, growing in my gifting and my relationship with God. And actually, for the most part, they're not all musical related. So there's the practical side. I try to work on my voice. I try to work on my musicality and my um, my music skills. Uh, I have regular times of worship at home by myself so that when I'm in the public and when I'm actually starting to release something in front of others, it's more natural to me because I feel that that's part of my um, it's, 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 it's part of my discipline in not allowing my lack of skill to get in the way when I'm, I'm starting to step out publicly. So I, I practice that. So I practice that musicality and understanding and learning how to hear God's voice at home on my own. But there's lots of other things that I do as well that are not music related at all. So I read a lot. I mean, I'm reading a couple of books a week. Uh, I might have them on audio in the car. I read my Bible a lot. I speak in tongues regularly. In fact, um, I've got a, that's actually been a life changing habit for me. I mean, I know not everybody listening to this podcast will be interested or do this. And if you want to know more about speaking in tongues, shoot us an email. I will send you some teaching around that. But for me in particular, the idea of my mind just getting out of the way and praying by speaking in tongues is actually for me a contemplative practice. It's a way that I I can meditate on the word and on the Lord without my thoughts getting in the way. And, and I actually tried an experiment last year where I decided to set aside 20 minutes, 10 to 20 minutes a day, where all I did was speak in tongues. I didn't uh, do it for any reason. I didn't do it while I was in the car or doing something else. I actually dedicated time where I wasn't doing anything else just speaking in tongues. And I'll be honest, it actually was really hard. I know probably some of you listening might go, well, I can do it for two hours and it's wonderful. But I found the first week, it was like three minutes felt like three hours, right? But I was determined that I was going to keep doing this. And um, as I continued to do it, it became easier and easier. I'm not going to lie, my blood pressure went down <laughs> and I don't have normally have high blood pressure, but I just felt my body just 
really starting to rest in the presence of the Lord. And um, I, I, it's interesting because nothing spectacular happened during that month of speaking in tongues for 20 minutes a day. But I did notice it got easier. It became more natural. It was easy to enter into it. And then I found it became a joy. I really enjoyed it. And then the amazing thing that came out of that is a, just a few weeks later, I started to develop all these incredible ideas. Um, my imagination went crazy. I was thinking up ideas for songs and books and online courses and journaling. And I realized that it actually all came from that time in prayer. And so now I dedicate myself to speaking in tongues and praying regularly as a life-changing habit that helps me to flow and helps me know how to flow. So meditating on the Lord, meditating on his word. Something else I really like to do is something I call imaginate. I imaginate. So when I'm going to minister somewhere, for example, I, I don't just hope it's going to be okay. I actually imagine what is going to happen. Um, you know, Romans 12 verse 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So I'm like, Lord, when I'm singing on that platform uh, or when I'm speaking on that platform, what are you saying, Father God? What are you wanting me to do? What is happening in the congregation? What is happening to people's hearts? I imagine that. And, you know, I did this when I first stepped into the prophetic. We had a prophetic word by Graham Cook who came to our church that talked about what was going to happen in the worship and that there would be there would be no gap between the congregation and the platform and at that time we had a very high platform and I remember you know when we used to lead worship prior to this prophetic word the congregation there was a really big gap and it was quite awkward and so because of that prophetic word I started to partner or process it in my own way I did what I call imaginate. So I closed my eyes and I would imagine that the congregation would just get rid of all their inhibitions. They would come to the front, that they would surrender, they would kneel, and there would be no longer this space or this gap. Now, I would do this at the beginning of services for a really long time. So, I, you know, if you're a worship pastor, you'll get this. You know, you start your service and there's hardly anybody there. You're like, where are the people? And it's about 20 minutes in the worship, you know, people are turning up, right? I mean, that's like a pet hate of every creative worship leader, <laughs> creative pastor or worship leader. And so I stopped being frustrated and I would close my eyes for those first 20 minutes. And I would imagine that the con congregation was completely in engaged, that the church was full from the beginning and that people were coming down the front. And I acted based on what I was imagining. Now, you might think that's crazy, but there's so many scriptures for another day we can talk about this, but Romans 12 verse 2 is the, the starting point, being transformed by the renewing of them of your mind, but also the scripture that says that we call things that are not as though they were. So I was doing that in my mind. Now, the outcome of that was actually quite beautiful and amazing. It took about two years but eventually the culture of that church became that people were immediately as the worship started, they would come down the front. And to this day, that has not changed. And that really came from that season in time where we decided, we made a decision as a team that we were going to imagine. And that really helped us to flow with what the spirit was doing. So the difference is we're not waiting and hoping for something to happen. We are pulling on it. We are going, God, we know this is what you want and we want to see your change come. So we partner with it and we draw it out of um, supernatural realms. We draw it out of that unseen realm and we bring it into the physical realm. Now, when it comes to flowing in a team, there's a little bit more of a dynamic that takes place here. So I'm talking about my personal flow, how I personally get ready. It's my lifestyle. And then I do things in my life to, to activate the, the con continuity of the spirit moving in my life. But also flowing in a team can be a little bit different. There's some different dynamics. And what I have found is that teams that spend a lot of time together in relationship, they spend lots of time practicing, lots of doing life together. 
the groundwork, of course, is cultivating your own walk, walk with the Lord and being responsible for your own oil, your own anointing, right? But when there's life being done aside from platform, beside, uh, aside from function, it really makes a difference to the team flowing together. And so that's something to consider. Now, you might be saying, Roma, our, our team is huge. We've got a really big team and that's really difficult. This is where cell groups come in. You as the creative arts pastor or worship pastor, you're not expected to go to everybody's house and have cups of tea or go out for coffees all the time. That's not physically possible. But breaking it down into hubs or smaller groups where people are doing life together and then putting relationship above, above function is a game changer. So that really makes a difference with moving in the flow. And then it just simply comes by practice. It's like a tap, you know, once you turn the tap on, it starts to flow. I just find that it becomes easier. It doesn't mean you won't sometimes feel resistance because of what's happening in the spiritual atmosphere, but um, you will actually find it easier to enter into that space where the flow, that prophetic flow is just there. All right, next question. Is prophetic worship singing or are there many facets? What a great question. Well, I think Prophetic worship can be much more than singing if you let it. It can be musical, can be an instrumental line, it could be a certain drum beat or a rhythm. I love what um, songwriter Brenton Brown says. I heard him once in a, a workshop say that the spontaneous is not always necessary in the prophetic, but space is. What a great comment. Space can be prophetic. Those musical interludes, those intros and those outros to songs, you know, allowing space for those is incredible. And um, it could be a, a, a bigger portion that even includes instrumental moments, you know, someone playing a violin for a few minutes or drums or a keyboard, you know, it's not always voice. And so definitely prophetic worship has many facets. Next question, how do you build your church worship team to be expectant and equipped for stepping into prophetic worship? Great question again. There's two things that I've found really help a worship team and congregation be expect expectant. And these are what they are. Number one, a culture where making mistakes is okay. A culture when making mistakes is okay. And number two, you're going to have to invest into years, not moments. Investing into years and not moments. Let me unpack that a little bit because your brain might be just going, what? So when I first started stepping into the prophetic, I did not know anyone. I know it's a thing now, but I did not know anyone that was um, operating in prophetic worship you know I'd, I and so when I led worship I didn't really have anybody to look to right which was really scary and I remember you know I'd start leading worship people would have their arms crossed I'd look at the team they'll completely disengage people were afraid to uh, engage because it was different so not just the congregation but the worship team they were like what if we mess up what about if we do something and it's not what God wants or we step out and it's it we make a terrible mistake and it's embarrassing and we we prevent people from stepping into the presence well having that mentality is that that's what I mean when I say if there is a culture where there's freedom to make mistakes it makes a huge difference in taking risks. And so I just started to take more risks. I started to um, give myself permission first to actually um, make mistakes. And I let the team know that if they made a mistake, it was okay. Now, early on in those days, uh, a lot of our team wouldn't do anything. And I'll share how I kind of got over that in a moment. And, but I, I just want to pause for a moment and say this, because some of you come from larger congregations where this idea of having a culture where there's a freedom to make mistakes can be dangerous because you could your people could bleed, your worship team could bleed all over the congregation. Now, we don't want that, right? And so I make the suggestion that provide other platforms to experiment with. 
It doesn't always have to be a Sunday service. You know, it could be a prayer meeting, a home group, rehearsals, uh, where you're purely practicing the prophetic. I know that sounds like an oxymoron. What? Practice the prophetic? But it really is a skill, not so much the prophecy part, but trusting that what you're hearing and sensing that ebb and flow, your um, receptors, understanding how you hear and receive. It's so important to practice that. And then letting your team know, hey, it's actually okay for you to give it a go. And also understanding, my friends, and I say this gently, you're not the only one, the only person that's going to have this gift. You know, disciple others to do it. Don't just hold it to one or two, two people in the team. If you really want to see an explosion of the prophetic in your church and your worship, more people have to have the freedom to actually experiment and then have a go. And so if you're the, the leader, what I'm actually saying is just let go. Let go and let them have a go. Let others have a go. A go. Don't hold the reins so tight. There's got to be some sort of trust. Everybody hates it when I say this. Many people go, oh, I don't know if what I think about this, but can I just tell you in my 30 years of leading worship, this was a game changer. This little shift, this little change caused explosions in a good way in, in the teams that we've worked with. So don't feel that you have to hold the reins so tight because what happens is when you're the one that's in charge like that and that you are the one that's like, I'll make sure that everything's okay here and I'll just do it or my worship leader will just do it. What actually happens is people don't own their responsibility, their part to play in the prophetic both on the team and in the congregation. They just think, I'll just let the leaders tell me what to do. And that actually is controlling, okay? I'm just going to call it for what it is. It's actually control. We, we're we not trying to perform. We are trying to usher in his presence. And so when people own it, when they know that their contribution matters, it changes everything. People start to get excited because they're no longer just a backing vocalist or just a bass player or just a drummer. They begin to realise and they start to come to services or events realising anything could happen. And so they awaken. They just come alive. They're like, wow, what's going to happen today? I don't know. And you'll find... At the beginning, people will be shy around this. People will be like, oh, I hope that I can do this. I hope that this is going to work. I hope I don't mess up. But after a while, you'll actually find it just becomes natural. And it's beautiful to watch. And then you're going to find phase two, after you've got all of that happening, is you actually have to start developing protocols around the prophetic because you won't be able to stop the prophetic flow, you will just, there'll be so many people wanting to release something either vocally or musically. And that's an awesome problem to have, to have to go, okay, well, what are our protocols on stage? What do we do when somebody wants to sing something or say something? So anything that you can do as a leader um, to, to usher this in is so important. I would even say, going throwing people in the deep end is a good thing sometimes you know asking someone to sing something out if you see something in them that they don't even see in themselves even in a service or some sort of worship time you watch what happens i've got this memory of doing this once to uh, one of our beautiful worship leaders at the time who had never stepped out in worship her name was ali and i remember just i could just hear it in her voice that she was she had the prophetic in her and so i um i remember just going in the middle of a service ali have you got something to sing and she just looked at me and her eyes looked like wells of fear. And she just said, no, no. And I said, no, you have. And I actually said it in the mic. I said, Ellie's going to sing something out right now. And she was like, you could tell she was going to throw daggers at me with her eyes. That's what it looked like. And she started to sing something out. And I'm telling you, it was so anointed. It was so incredible. I will never forget it. And I remember she said to me at the end of the service, I can't believe you did that, but I'm so glad that you did. And that girl today is one of the most incredible prophetic worship leaders I know. And it was all because she stepped out when she really didn't think she had what it, 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 
what it was going to take, but she, she actually really did. So that freedom to make mistakes. Now, the idea of investing into years, not moments. You know, we all want that moment in a service where God is doing something incredible, but it can take years to develop that. So understanding this is like a slow cooker. Worship should be like a slow cooker, not a fast food meal. It's going to take time to develop those flavors and develop what God wants you to do during those moments. Next question is, is all worship prophetic? And if not, which worship is prophetic and which isn't? Another great question. This is what I think. I don't think all worship is prophetic. All worship can be worship. But what makes worship prophetic? Well, let's break down the word prophet. And that'll help us to understand what kind of worship is prophetic. So let me give you some very quick ideas of what the word prophet means theologically. Well, firstly, a prophet is... If you are a prophet, you are a spokesperson. The literal translation of the word prophet actually means spokesperson. You're representing the words of Christ. So prophet doesn't always mean you're seeing into the future. Um, so what does that mean as a worship leader? You're speaking on behalf of Christ or, or as a musician. You're speaking, your instrument is speaking on behalf of Christ. You are representing his truth through song which is why, side note, it should be theologically sound. That's super important. But a prophetic song or prophetic worship has to have what is God wanting to say, not just about the future, but what is he wanting to say in the moment. Here's another idea. It bubbles forth. So the Hebrew word for prophet is nabi, N-A-B-I, which means to bubble forth as from a fountain or to utter. And this is actually the first word used in the Bible to describe what a prophet is. What does that mean practically? Well, probably where we actually get the idea of the spontaneous or spontaneous worship is from this word. But there's also this, because it's about bubbling up, you know, there's this idea um, that inspiration just comes upon you and bubbles forth. Um, whether that's sp spontaneous or not, there's this inspiration to sing a prophetic song. It bubbles and it springs forth out of you. Now, you might have had that feeling when you've sung a song that you know that was chosen by God for the moment and you come alive. You feel like it's this deep well inside of you. Spring up, oh well. You feel that bubbling forth. So it's, it's a song or a, a sound that bubbles forth. Another idea is the song should help people see. So in Samuel's time, there was another word. If we go to 1 Samuel 9 verse 9, there's another word that was used to describe the word prophet, and that is ro'er, R-O apostrophe E-H, and that translated as the word seer. So this word occurred seven times when describing Samuel the prophet, and then later another word was added, Jose, H-O-Z-E-H, which again means See, you can find that in 2 Samuel verses 24, uh, chapter 24, verse 11, 1 Chronicles 29, verse 29. All these three words are used and they all mean seer. So what does this mean in terms of worship? Well, the song helps people see what God wants them to see. It brings revelation to people. And, you know, here's an example. Have you ever released a song or been in a service where you've heard a song being song, sung and you saw the congregation wake up. They came alive. They were visibly moved as you sang it. That's the ex perfect example of a prophetic song. So if we just wrap up those three ideas, you can see that there's prophets, right? But there's different words for the word prophet in scripture. Maybe this is just my thoughts, right? Maybe that possibly describes the flavor or the function of the person or the personality of the prophetic. And the same thing happens with our prophetic worship too. When it is prophetic, 
it has a different assignment or it has a different function. It will be a different sound, different flavor, depending on who the spokesperson is for God's message for the moment, what the team is, what region you are in, uh, what your church culture is like, what country you're from. And so all worship isn't prophetic unless if we're really going to use the Bible as our foundation, it has to have those elements in it. Another question, is singing over a person considered prophetic? Is singing over a person considered prophetic? Well, yes, it can be if we use the template of what I've just shared about what makes worship prophetic. The idea that we're the spokesperson, if we sing over them the words of God, you know, we'll see amazing things happen. But remember this, it's not always prophetic words singing about the future. You could be singing healing over them. You could be playing sounds that bring healing over them. We've done this before um, as one of our practice exercises where we just get people to play an instrument over somebody and it might and with the intentionality of something. So we might say, let's put this person in the middle and we'll get the keyboard player to just play healing. If healing was a sound, what would it sound like? In fact, side note again, I'm doing lots of side notes in this podcast, but the song intro music that you hear and the outro music in this podcast is actually from my song, Release the Sound. And the verses in that song are, if healing was a sound, what would it sound like? If freedom was a song, what would it feel like? You know, you can actually have a sound that releases something. So, Singing over a person can be considered prophetic if we use that template of what it means to be a prophet, if we actually apply that to what our songs should look like. And and just keeping in mind, it's not always singing something about the future. You could be singing healing, you could be playing sounds um, that bring freedom and so on. Next question, what does worship warfare or warfare worship sound like? And is this used in church services? I loved this question. What does warfare worship sound like? And so to answer this question, I want to talk to you first about sound. Different sounds can actually represent different things. Different sounds can represent different things. Now, I know I'm speaking really fast here because I'm trying to get lots of information in, but You might go, what? That makes no sense. Well, if you don't believe me, think of some sounds that you take for granted. They're not saying anything. There's no words behind it, right? But you know what they mean simply by the sound. Here's some ideas for you. The sound of a doorbell means someone's at your front door. So it's not It doesn't go, there's someone at the door. It's just a sound, ding dong, or whatever. If I actually did that to you, you would know what that meant. There's someone at the door. When your phone rings, you know somebody's trying to contact you. When your alarm goes off in the morning, it's time to wake up. What about the Netflix sound? When you log into Netflix, for those of you who are movie buffs, when you hear that sound, even if you weren't watching TV, if you actually watch Netflix a lot and you hear the sound, you you just know straight away that's Netflix. What about movie theme songs? So if I say these movies, if you're a movie buff, you will know the theme songs. Star Wars. I'll let you think about that sound for a moment. Mission Impossible. Dun, 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 or whatever it is, but you know what I mean. When you hear them, just by the sound, you know what they are. And this is the same with worship in general, but also warfare worship, if we want to answer this question. It has a unique sound. It's not necessarily defined by just lyrics, but it's also a sound. So it might sound like battle. It might sound like a fight. Usually it's quite rhythmic and there's a focus on the drums. But I want to say this that um, style and sound are two different things. Style and sound are two different things. Someone might think, for example, that worship warfare or warfare worship is categorized by a minor key and lots of toms in the drums, but that's actually really a style. That was probably the 80s and the 90s, which is what I grew up with. Um, That style has even changed over the decades, but generally you can tell when a worship song is a warfare song. It's a song 
that inspires the congregation or a person to rise up in their authority as sons and daughters of God. It gets people encouraged to fight the good fight. So the lyrics, you know, they can sometimes talk about fighting or overcoming, winning the war. Um, they'll be full of prophetic declaration, declaring what God has done or who he is right now or what he's going to do. Uh, warfare worship usually has an intercession component. You're warring in the heavens, you know. It can often be about fighting the darkness and warfare worship is usually a great example actually of the marriage of worship and intercession it's this great combination of song and prayer and is it used in services to answer that question well yes it is but i don't think it's used enough i actually think the songs that we really um lack currently and this has been for a long time to be honest is songs that simply declare who god is we're not asking for anything. We're just exalting him. But also songs that um, have this warfare component in them. We are fighting and we're winning a war because God is our captain. He's the captain of the army. You might be asking yourself, well, can you give me some examples of some warfare songs? Yes, I can. I'll start with one from scripture and that's in Exodus 15. It's often called the Song of Miriam and Moses. And it was the song that was sung after they crossed the Red Sea. And if you read, I'll read a little bit of it to you. It's, I will sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted, both horse and driver. He has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He's become my salvation. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. That's an example. The whole chapter actually is really amazing. And I often imagine what it must have been like for thousands of Israelites to be taught that song that probably lasted generations because it was a moment in time it was a it was a stone a a a marker in the road as it were that helped people remember who God was and that he was a powerful he was powerful against the armies another modern day example would be that song by Elevation Worship, I'm going to see a victory. You know, the, the words are, the weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. And so on. I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to the Lord. Or what about this great song from the 90s? I loved this song, The Days of Elijah by Robin Mark. Um, the words are, these are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these days are of great trial, of famine and darkness and sword, still we are the voice in the desert crying, prepare the way of the Lord. And so on. What a song. What great lyrics. I mean, that as I read it, I just feel the prophetic voice of God as I read it. So they would be examples of warfare worship and yes we should be singing it more in churches all right here's another question for you we're nearly done with our epic questions q and a's for our last session here um someone asked the question navigating the music director slash worship leader relationship in prophetic worship what's your tips for unity in this space i think this is such a great question because Anybody that's listening to this, you've who's been in worship for a long time, you've probably had those moments where maybe the worship pastor or the music director and the worship leader don't really hit it off or have different ideas about how things should be done. And I'll start by saying, and this is something you'll know already, but relationship is so important. Off the platform, relationship is so so important and the bottom line is if you don't have that relationship on a personal or a friendship level that communication becomes more difficult again some of you come from large churches that are listening to this and i want to say to you we have to make this a priority somehow you've got to think of ways first to make this happen before anything else because if relationship is not there People are going to not step out like they should and uh, there will be a little bit of disunity in the team as much as you might love them and as much as you might love that person. Now, does that mean that you always have to agree? No. You know, I think that we have developed this culture where we think something's wrong if people have disagreements. That's not the case at all. You can actually disagree and still have unity. You can. You really can. And that's the only way that you can 
is relationship has to be primary. When you truly know the person, you know how to interact and you know how to work together, don't you? It's really powerful. You know, I remember um, my worship pastor, this is many years ago now, I'm going to show my age, but an amazing pastor, Andy Naylor, if he's ever listening to this, but uh, we used to have, we had some amazing worship times in our church services. He was a great worship pastor and I remember after a while, we just knew each other so well because we had a relationship and friendship on a personal level that he didn't have to say anything on the platform. I could just tell where he was going to go or where he wanted to go or if I had permission simply by the look on his face. And we used to joke that we'd know what to do, where to even go in a song, what section to go to simply by what his eyebrows were doing. <laughs> I know that sounds silly, but it was true. We would be like, when Andy does that thing with his eyebrows, we know that means go to the top, you know? And that all simply came from relationship. So if you don't know that person, that worship leader, that music director, make an effort to get to know them outside of worship events, see them for who they are, see the gift that's on their life and the potential that they could bring to seeing the freedom in prophetic worship being released in your services. And, you know, another way to develop that and to have unity in that space, I do think that it is important to unpack and discuss when things happen in a service. So whether that's amazing or something doesn't work the way that it should we're not doing a review I think review services are horrible if I be honest because it's performance motivated but this idea of discussion you know like when you did this um, what were you sensing or when you do this how can I best support you uh, what about what do you expect when we hit a spontaneous moment like what's your process or what was your process when you did that uh, what is my part to play how can I support you in this I think that's another important question in developing that relationship and having unity in that space another great question how can a backing vocalist best support their worship leader in a spontaneous worship moment vocally how can a backing vocalist best support them i love this question because one thing that backing vocalists can automatically do when a worship leader sings out, out spontaneously is they just put their mic down and they just wait until it's over and you know a great backing vocalist i'll tell you does this they do what their name suggests they back the vocalist they if there's a spontaneous moment, you don't check out. You're like, what's my part to play in this? So what can you pay attention for? So firstly, do not put that mic down. Keep it on your mouth and make sure that you're actually ready to sing whatever is going to happen. Here's some things to pay attention to. Number one, is the main worship leader singing anything that's repetitive? If so, you can sing along, you might add harmonies. You know, when you do this, it does two things, right? It actually inspires the worship leader to keep going. It grows in their confidence as well. But also when you start to sing backing vocalists like that, the congregation join in because they see it as a group thing, not just a worship leader going off on a tangent. Um, it might not even be lyrics or words that you're repeating it could be oohs and ahs you know in harmony that is backing the worship leader if you're an instrumentalist what about um you know if the instrumentalist it, it, is there again if freedom was a sound what would it sound like if you're hearing somebody sing something out and what you could be asking yourself the question what can i play that matches what they're saying that intentionality is really incredible so there's nothing more powerful than backing vocalists engaging with a song being released it acts like the glue for what the main leader is singing well we did nine questions and i hope that that helped you we will do q a again but i just want to say thank you for sticking with me for this epic 10 episode podcast um you know the lord's done some amazing things in my heart too as we have done this together and i just want to say again if you're listening to this on podcast you can go and check out this video on youtube on my youtube channel uh we've also set up so many people were asking 
they wanted to sponsor the podcast, you can check out Buy Me A Coffee. The link is in our show notes here um, and you can sponsor this podcast as well. I just want to say thank you. I want to say I cannot wait to hear your stories of what the Lord is releasing through your worship. And again, just say, just take the risks step up and step out because this hour it is so important that we do this we've got we don't have time to wait we don't have time to mess around i feel this urgency in my spirit that the lord really wants us to be brave and release a new sound across the earth so release that sound release the sound of heaven pour it out amongst your congregations and i cannot wait to see you for season two of release the sound podcast be blessed